Good evening, friends and family of Journey Church, and welcome to Wine Press, our Bible study through the book of Revelation, tying in current news, technology, and science to prophecy, and John's vision in Revelation. I can't thank you enough for being here with us tonight, and thank you for the emails, the cards, the letters, most of all, most of all your prayer. And of course, we appreciate the financial support that many of you are sending in to make sure we can continue giving you updates on this ministry. Now, I've had several people ask, what about a book? Uh, well, I've got good news. I met with my ghostwriter yesterday, and a book will begin in process. Now, that means it could take up to a year or more for it to become available. So, but it's in process. And I've had many ask, would it be available on thumb drive files when we complete? We are working on that as well. But the good news, if you're a Journey Church family member, is this upcoming Sunday is our big reveal about where do we go from here as far as a church and a home. What do we do if you're not familiar with Journey Church? We've been around about 10 years now, and we've been homeless for 10 years. And God's doing some super great stuff, so you don't want to miss our live broadcast Sunday. And you really, if you're local... Come be with us. We've got plenty of room. 350 seats and two services. Plenty of room to have you back right here with us for worship this upcoming week. Now, as we do at the beginning of every one of our tapings for the book of Revelation, we're going to have a prayer with you. So if you would, take a moment. Let's offer a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for your goodness to us and revealing who your Son, Jesus Christ, is. Tonight, Lord, the chapter that we're in covers three of the best things other than the rapture. It covers the songs of Alleluia. It covers the wedding of the bride to Jesus Christ and the return of the king to his kingdom. And Father God, that, that's what we're living for. That's the moment, God. So, Lord, I pray tonight that you help me go into it and teach it, not just with the education and the revelation that you've given. But God with Holy Spirit guidance. And more revelation. Even as I teach. Show me more. So that the body can be prepared. And the children can be ready. And God will give you honor and praise for what you accomplish. In Christ's name. And we all said together. Amen. Now I think it's significant. Even before I go into the breaking news. That's happened in the last couple of weeks. Um, we started Journey Church. We had been probably in our offices for maybe a week. And a gentleman who was part of our church then, great, great man of God, came by and sat with me and said, Pastor, I have a word from the Lord for you. And I remember laying back in my chair and grabbing the arms because I was so proud. You know, we had followed the Lord. We had started a brand new ministry. We were really doing great. Good money in the bank. God pouring out His Spirit. And he looked at me and leaned across my desk and said with a stern face, God told me to tell you he didn't call you to plant a church. And I remember backing up across my, my desk going, well, what do you mean God didn't call me to plant a church? It's kind of late for that. We've already done it. We've already gotten started. Here we are. And he leaned back and snickered and he said, let me finish. God didn't call you to plant a church. That's his job. He called you to prepare the bride. And you know, you can't get the significance of that in your mind, honestly, until you read and understand chapter 19, and you start to see what's going on. And to help us get there, there are actually some events in the news. Now, when I take you through the breaking news tonight, I'm going to have to dovetail into some things that I reported on last week, particularly the Blue Beam Project. Because something happened this week to bring that in. It, it, it's amazing to absolutely put that on track. You know, all the pieces have to come together. And they have since World War II. Pieces have been laid down. But now, with what happened this week, my, my. The possibility for it happening immediately all over the world. All over the world is now here. Hmm. So let's go take a look at the news. Let's start with some things going on in China right now. Now, 
if you understand some of the things I taught during the trumpets, the bowls, and the plagues, one of the things that you start to pay attention to is the country of China. China's symbol is the dragon. And we know that, that nation's symbols is the flag of the tribe. And even the children of Israel have different symbols or different flags for each different tribe. And, and this, is, this is a biblical concept, okay? So, like the marking of the lion for England or the marking of the lion for Babylon, okay? And we see the bear and the leopard and all these things marking Greece and the, the Grecian countries and all throughout time. But what's interesting about China right now is China is, has been positioning themselves for the last 20, 25 years, buying American companies, buying American properties, because uh, the American loves money over the future. We tend, to be, we tend to be all a little nearsighted, and we think of current financial gain and not actually what's happening, especially if you're in business and you don't pay attention to prophecy or history to understand how people work. Now, China is overpopulated, under-resourced. Right now, <clears throat> just on my way here to do the recording, I received a news flash that right now there's one of the reasons that we're moving into a pork uh, decrease in population here in the United States. And, of course, that interests me because I'm a bacon lover. And what's happening right now is uh, there's a shipping company making money hand over fist because China is buying all of the hogs that we will sell to repopulate their herds because theirs have died from disease. And so they're depopulating us to populate them. Much happened years ago with concrete in the building industry. Concrete prices here in the United States went sky high and you couldn't hardly find concrete anymore. And it was because it was all being shipped to China to use in their growth explosion that they were having. Well, <clears throat> because China currently is anti-Yahweh. See, I can't say they're anti-God or they're a godless nation because there is a God of communism. There is a God of atheism and that God is gnosis. That God is knowledge. That God has nothing to do with the God of faith. Which Yahweh is a God of faith. He's a spirit. Those that worship Him, worship Him in spirit and in truth. You can't worship God when He remains invisible. If you want a visible God, it's got to be something you can see, touch, taste, and put your hands on. You with me so far? So we're told in the last days that famines, pestilences, earthquakes... So when you follow international news right now, and you do better, I've had many ask me, where do you get some of these articles? Listen, the United States news media is wrapped up in the issues of the U.S. If you want to see the issues of the world, you're going to have to link to European news sites and follow them because they're reporting all the news across the European nations as one thing. Okay? So in China right now, massive rains Massive earthquakes, massive flooding. Right now, they're reporting 63 people that have died. This is just two provinces right now that are experiencing massive, massive floodings. The rivers are running over, and they've been in drought for a long time. Now, the drought has ended, and the floods are just wiping people out. There have been stories put out by Reuters News of, uh, of little Chinese fellows on mopeds driving them underwater putting snorkels on them to get air because transportation has ended in several provinces. And we're talking about, we're talking about um, 8.5 million people currently affected right now. 8.5 million. And it's still raining. It's not slowing up. It's not easing up. So the nation, and China positioned themselves. I started by saying this. Pardon me. Let me go back. China began positioning themselves 20, 25 years ago to take over the world. They want to be the center of a one world government and a one world economy. So everything they're doing works toward that. Let, let, let me show you some other things happening in the news right now. <clears throat> you know, our, our president 
uh, understands what's happening in space and how space is, because of technology, through the different things going on with, with HARP and DARPA, that weather, you know, we have the capacity to control weather. We have the capacity to control a lot of things, but it all happens from space. And he who controls the space is going to wind up controlling the world. Okay? So our president's put in the SpaceX program. Well, you know, I'd like to tell you our president's going to be president forever. But the truth is, because in the last days, things are getting worse and worse. And Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24 that in the last days, men's hearts would fail them because of fear. And, and, and the greatest thing that will cause the failure will be offense. People being offended. Well, if you want to see offense on a grand scale right now, just watch the news or go to social media. I mean, policemen are resigning, quitting, and walking away. They're just walking away. We're told that lawlessness would abound. Well, no police force, lawlessness is going to abound. And what the United States does affects the world. What's going on here is creating riots and stirs all across the world. Now, there's debates about who's funding it and whatever and whatever. But I shared with you last week, okay, this Blue Beam project and how it would work from satellites embedded deep in space. Well, just watch what's happened. Elon Musk, who is a friend of current administration, Elon Musk, guys, <clears throat> owns a company called Neuralink. We've talked about Neuralink. Neuralink is the chip that they've prepared to be inserted in the human brain. That will tie your brain. It could be connected to what's the mark of the beast. To tie your brain into a satellite feed. I shared with you last week. These chips can be outfitted with. In fact the Vera chip was outfitted with. A VLF slash ELF receiver. So that you could receive transmissions. That would affect your brain and your body. Okay. Now, now follow with me. He's already on record saying that every man's a cyborg. And it's his life's work to help complete that mission. Now, now, the U.S. government has given him permission to launch up to 42,000 Starlink satellites into orbit around the Earth. And, and here's what, this is the perfect platform for the Blue Beam Project. It's also the perfect platform for mind control and emotion control, for people control. And I shared with you the verse in Revelation last week where the Antichrist is written of the Antichrist and he says, He caused all men, small and great, to bow and worship the image of the beast. He caused it. Okay? Now, his quote, when presented with this article, his quote was, Every point on the earth's surface will see at all times a SpaceX link satellite. So the foundation of communication has been set in space for what we talked about last week, the Blue Beam Project. Something visualized in the 70s by a man that began working on this. The pieces are all coming into place. Next slide. Now last week, I touched on with you the technology and the patent from October 27th, 1992. The patent called Silent Subliminal Presentation System. Technology discovered in World War II, now patented. And this patent, it covers the technology where frequencies can be run to the human brain and devices created through the aircraft division of the, the Naval Air Force War Warfare Center, which is a division off of HARP, a division of the United States Navy. Okay? This, this technology available to create silent communications with information perceived by a listener's brain. In other words, you can look up, see an image, see its lips moving, and there be no audible voice, but you hear the voice in your head in your own language. We talked about that last week in greater depth. What we didn't talk about last week was when this technology was put in place, the new patents that begin being applied for. Because whoever controls the patent controls the money. You with me? They're going to make money during this new world order and a Christ system. Now watch. Next slide. 
I want to show you, you can look up these patent numbers. Okay? <clears throat> U.S. patent number. All right? Listen. An apparatus for producing visual stimulation. Other words, through a frequency put in the brain, they can make you see things that aren't there. The next one. An apparatus for producing visual and audio stimulation. To see and hear things that are being communicated to you from another source. The next one. Um, a nervous system excitation device. A device designed to control your emotions. That if you're showing out and you want to rebel, they can calm you. That if they want you to fight, they can fire you up and agitate you and make you angry. How about this? An apparatus for producing sleep. Just put you down. How about this one? Uh, an auditory subliminal message system, which we already looked at. An auditory subliminal programming system. Remember, if you've got the neural net link in your head, it's a computer chip. There's the patent for programming it from space from a satellite. Now, these things are, now if you're a child of God, if you're, you're not going to be here when this stuff happens. You're, you're going to get to avoid what, what those who have rejected Christ are going to be under the influence of. The one thing that probably breaks my heart more than anything else, other than the prodigal, the prodigal who asked Christ into their life, but they're not enjoying their life right now. Prodigal, come home. But the one thing that probably breaks my heart more is a Christian who reads and studies Revelation, reads the things that the devil is going to try to destroy God's children with, and they get a little self-righteous and feel good about it and wag their head and say, well, I'm not going to be here. But you know what? It's not God's will that any should perish. Your father doesn't want any of his children to go through this. You're going to have to run all over His grace, mercy, and goodness to avoid His love. And when the churches that belong to God begin acting like His Son Jesus, loving everybody, loving those... I mean, the story of the Good Samaritan isn't just a story. It's a picture, a model of what every believer is supposed to be. You and I are supposed to be traveling those roads of robbers you and I are supposed to be rescuing those in the highways byways and hedges and you know it's a sad mark against the body of Christ when you can't even get volunteers to keep a nursery and every church struggles with it and you you can't it may be saying every is not the right word to say the majority of churches and pastors I know all have the same struggle. But then to get people out of their complacent lives at home to go into the harvest field. And for some to think that the harvest field is walking a sidewalk. That's not the harvest field. Highways, byways, hedges. That's, it, it's the rescue missions. It's the, the patches of woods where the homeless are. It's the, it's the places where the broken are, the emergency rooms, the intensive care waiting rooms, the places where people feel hopeless and alone and desperate. It's the orphan child that doesn't have a parent or a family. It's, it, it's those people that they don't know. They don't know how much Jesus loves them. They've been told they weren't good enough. They weren't smart enough. They weren't dressed well enough. They've been told that their failures have defined their life. Not the fact they're made in His image. That defines their life. And it's our job to identify them and love on them. And we've got to do that, church. Let's go ahead. I've got just a couple of more articles. And we're going to jump into Scripture tonight. So the UN, they met this past week. And the UN created what they're going to be discussing next year. They've created this thing called an Act for Nature. And in the Act for Nature, this is a quote from the newspaper. Here's what Joyce Masuya, the director, wrote. She said, we could take a big step towards a new world order if, if we no longer grow at the expense of nature. But see the planet growing together. 
Now, please understand this is a smoke screen. Okay? The whole eugenics project, controlling of population, killing of certain races and people that they feel aren't uh, as superior as they are. Th- this, whole, this whole design, this whole design is about population control. This whole design is about there's not enough resources to sustain people, they say. This has been the cry. Uh, when, when I was a kid, I grew up at the tail end of the hippie movement. And I remember reading comic books about ecology and the ecology flag, the green and white flag with the funky E in it, and the whale watchers and the tree huggers and, and, and all this stuff. And if we don't protect the resources, there are not enough people to sustain the resources. That's a smoke screen around. There are just certain people we don't think are good enough to live on the same ball that we live on. Because, let me show you something. Now, this article goes on because, watch, this... New World Order Connection, this study, has been done in relationship with the Chinese government. And the Chinese government has started a project they call OBOR. Pay attention to that, OBOR. One belt, one road. What they want to do is create the old Silk Road route again across Europe. And they want to become the center of of all world trade and all world commerce. Just think how many products are on your shelf in your home or in your garage or on your body right now that were all made in China versus made in any other country or in the United States. Okay, They know that by providing, here's what they've learned, by providing cheap resources, they can go into any world market and make people dependent on what they manufacture. And we sit around and argue over who's making the most money and, and trade unions and all these employment unions that drive up wages, drive up benefits, drive up prices on our products so high that we can't afford to buy American products. We have to buy the foreign products because we can't. the economies of the world are in balance, which is why you see some believe in communism and a one world order. Because a one world order means one world product, one world pricing, that all economies of the world now balance out. The minimum wage in India is the same as the minimum wage in the U.S., is the same as the minimum wage in China. See, it all sounds good on paper. The problem when there's not the right supply, demand, economic chain going on is it eliminates middle class. And it creates the ultra wealthy and then the poor class. That works and serves and labors. And then it creates another class of people that just won't work at all. And you've got a group working and a group not working. Making the same thing. The drive to earn. The drive to be rewarded goes away. Once the drive to be rewarded goes away, people don't function. It's a shame our schools don't teach economics and sociology and civics like they used to. But they need to. Write your congressman. Look at the next part of this. Because President, President Trump, by the way, is fighting this. He's created one in, in, in direct opposition to this. And it's called the Free and Open Indo-Pacific Strategy, the FOIP. And you're going to hear this in the future, but not on our news. You'll hear it in European news. Because he's battling this. He doesn't want China to take over the world. Okay? Next slide. Still part of this. All from Breaking Israel News. Okay, now this is what's funny. The European Union supports OBOR. They're behind it. In fact, Marcon, and if you looked at our earlier studies about Emmanuel Marcon, his potential setting up the office of the Antichrist, he is all for it. Okay, all these European nations are for it. But here's a group that's for it that kind of blew my mind. Okay, the WHO. The World Health Organization. Now tell me what the health organization has got to do with China being the center of world commerce. Yet, in this meeting, the head of the WHO is sitting with the leaders of OBOR discussing how they can help promote and forward this agenda. But that's even crazier. Watch this. At this table... In the background of the photo op, they have the Indian goddess statue here. 
The same statue that sits in front of the EU in Brussels. The same statue that sits outside of the CERN headquarters where they discovered the God particle is Shiva, the destroyer. Now, if you study your world history back, this lady is no more than Semiramis, wife of Nimrod. If you've been here for the last few weeks, and you know she's also the woman you see holding the baby of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. Okay, but to be symbolized, there's a table sitting here working at the feet of the god Des, they call the destroyer. Mm-mm-mm. My, my, my. And WHO recently has been accused of serving China's interest in the recent COVID-19 pandemic. Protecting, covering up, hiding numbers for China. Hmm. Amazing. Now, let's drop the news. I believe we're past our news. Let's just go into 19. Let's go into some good news. Because now the vision in chapter 19. Remember, so far, John's vision has been all about what's happening on earth. Now, real quick, we're going to switch over to what's happening in heaven. And by the way, these events are simultaneous to what's going on the last three and a half years. Okay? Now, let's, let's read Revelation 19. Okay? Now, let me take you. In Revelation 19, we're going to see three amazing things happen in one chapter. We're going to see, first, the four hallelujahs. Okay? Secondly, we're going to see the wedding take place of the bride of Christ to, the, to Christ. The third thing we're going to see is the return of the king after the wedding. So we're going to take verses, uh, chapter 19, verses 1 through um, 7 first. And we're going, to, we're going to pull those apart, okay? 19, 1. And after these things, visions changed, earth to heaven. I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. Now, <clears throat> these people are the same people that we saw, remember, Heaven, earth. Remember, we were in heaven before. John's vision was in heaven before he saw all these things in the earth. So we're going right back there to overlay what's happened in heaven, what's happening in earth. They're paralleling. But, now, but we, we can't parallel talk. So we hit it, rewind, go back, catch up. Okay? And, and these much people that are in 5, 11, and 12. We know those people are the raptured church and the tribulation saints. Those that accepted Christ during the tribulation and died. In fact, if you look over in chapter 20, verse, uh, verse 4, you see the direct description of these people where he says they, um, they were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. They didn't worship the beast, didn't worship his image, didn't receive the mark in their foreheads or in their hands. And so they live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Okay? So we know it's this group, and they're a large group. Because we speak of the body of Christ, we're talking about saints from the beginning, not just saints from your, your childhood, your lifespan. Okay, People from the beginning to now that committed and gave themselves to God and the promise of Jesus Christ. Okay, <clears throat> And they're saying, here's the first hallelujah. They're saying, hallelujah. They're singing. They're singing glory, salvation, glory, honor, and power to the Lord our God. Here's the funny thing. Why are they singing? Why is there four hallelujahs, not three? Why is it hallelujah? Hallelujah means let's all praise and give glory to God. Okay? Why are they doing that? Well, in Isaiah, you know, it was kind of prophesied, Isaiah 45 and 23, that every knee would bow, every tongue would confess that He is Lord. What you're fixing to see in heaven is a representation of all creation and all of man. Because through this crowd is, is representatives from every tribe, every nation, and every time period standing before the throne of God. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that He is God. Okay? It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. So the first group of people we see singing hallelujah are those that, that made it through the rapture, those that are the bride of Christ, and those tribulation saints. Now, 
Uh, secondly, they go on singing. And by the way, if you want to hear this song, type in Revelation 19.1 in YouTube, Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir or BTC. Carol Cimbala has written a song from this and has like a 250 voice choir singing it. And my God, the hair on your neck will stand up. It's beautiful, okay? For true and righteous are his judgments, verse 2. For he has judged the great whore. Isn't that funny? Because in 1819, all these people in heaven are crying out, God, do something. They're pleading, God, do something. Now in 19 and 1, they're all rejoicing because he did. Because God's faithful. He kept his word. In Genesis, he told the devil, you might bruise my heel, but I'm going to crush your head. And he's done it. In a biblical time of weeks, 7,000 years, he's done it. Okay? Now watch. Which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Verse 3. And again they said, same group now, again, second time, same group sings, Alleluia. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. In other words, her prayers, her prayers came to God forever and ever. Now verse 4, we get to the third Alleluia. And the four and twenty elders... And the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, So be it. They're agreeing with the first group. So be it, and Alleluia. Now, if you want to understand who these four and twenty elders are, okay, you're going to have to jump ahead with me to chapter 21, verses 12 and 14. Chapter 21, verses 12 and 14, we see exactly who they are. Verse 12, it says, And had a wall great and high, and twelve gates, and the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. So we know that twelve of these elders are the chieftains, or the heads, of the twelve sons of Jacob. Then he goes to verse 14 and says, And on the wall of the city there were twelve foundations. And those twelve foundations had to them the names of the twelve apostles of the lambs. So we're given who the twenty-four is. You don't have to guess. Now when we look back in chapter 4, we looked and saw who the beasts were. The beasts are, follow with me, the lion, the ox, the eagle, the man. These sat on the four corners of the throne of God. What you don't realize yet, that I'm going to take you into, is that these four corners, okay, also represent not only the four kingdoms and the four ends of the earth. These four corners represent the four characteristics of Jesus Christ. Yes. They also represent a chupa. If you've ever been to a Jewish wedding, they get married under a four-cornered tent. And the walls are left open so all the world can see to the north, south, east, and west. The ceremony taking place. Everything about a Jewish wedding ties directly to the coming of Christ and the marriage of the Lamb to the Son. Now, it it gets really beautiful because when you look at the four animals, we know those represent the four kingdoms. So we've got all the saints represented, Old Covenant, New Covenant with the 24 elders. Then we've got all the animal kingdom represented. Eagle, the one who is the chief of those in the air flies above lion king of the wild beasts those untamed the ox king of the cattle the tame beast the servants to man and then we have mankind who is the king of the earth not the king of kings but mankind was given dominion by God and told to rule over everything but did you also know follow this that Matthew describes Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah That Mark describes Jesus as the servant of man, the son of man, the ox, the calf. That that John describes Jesus, the man, as the word of God. And that Luke describes him in his majesty, in his glory, his majesty, his splendor, as that of the eagle, the one who is above all. So see, everywhere you go in the Bible, same symbolism, same connections, Nothing changes. Nothing's missed. Okay? Now, verse 5. 
And I heard a voice come out of the throne. That's strange. I'd like to tell you I have an interpretation for this verse. But I don't. I know that the throne of God is the mercy seat. I know that the throne of God is where God dwells and inhabits. Plus, He's everywhere. I know that. God's the Spirit. He's everywhere. But now the throne of God begins speaking. And the throne of God, this is, look at what it says. Praise our God, all ye servants and all that fear Him, both small and great. And then he said, look, I heard as it was the voice of a great multitude. There's a response. There's a response. The throne of God says, Give God the glory. Give the Father the glory. He's faithful. He did what he said he'd do. And I heard, as it were, the voice, verse 6, of a great multitude and the voice of uh, many waters and the voice of mighty thundering saying the fourth one, Alleluia, for the Lord our God omnipotent reigneth. Whew. Let us be glad, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. See, church is not called church. From chapter 4 to here, church is not called church. It's called the wife, the bride of Christ. So we know chapter 4, rapture took place. We also know because of the organization and structure of a Jewish wedding. Now watch. We know it's happened. Uh, verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now, for you to grab this, Kelly, let's go to our slide where I found a comparison. And I'm going to add to it. But I found a comparison of the, the Jewish wedding and the wedding in heaven. And what we're told throughout Scripture. Now, you're going to see... That in both weddings, covenant, cup, price, departure, return, bridal chamber, supper, new home. But I'm going to take chapters eight, chapter 19 all the way through twenty, the end of 20. And I'm going to show you just in the story of the wedding how it's played out. Now a Jewish wedding is broken down into two parts. There's the Kiddushin. And the Kiddushin is, is the betrothal part. And let me break down to you how it goes. The second part is the actual marriage and what happens in the seven days that follow after the marriage. That's called the nishan, like mission but with an N, the nishan. Okay? In the betrothal, here's what happens. The groom stands afar and chooses his bride. Remember, <clears throat> God pulled out of the garden. But he chose his bride. The bride's chosen. Second step. The husband, the want-to-be husband, then meets with the father. Remember? God looked all over heaven, couldn't find anybody worthy. Jesus stepped up. He chooses, he meets with the father, and he tells of his intent, and the bride price is set. Then the bride has to accept. Here's salvation. The bride has to accept what is offered to her. And a contract is given. A ketuba. Now, here's the ketuba. This is the contract given. We've been given a new covenant. There was the old. Now there's the new. We've been given the new covenant. Then a home is prepared. He leaves. And a home is prepared. That home then has to be approved of by the father. Before the son can go get his bride. You with me? Let's, let's, he has no idea when his father's going to say he's ready. See, no man knows a daytime. Not even the son knows when the father is going to say, go get her. All this ties directly into a Jewish wedding. Now, let me show you something. In John 13, 36, we see the picture of this. In John 13, 36, <clears throat> okay, Jesus says, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you'll follow me afterwards. Jesus is telling them, I've got to leave you. Following Jewish tradition, of, I've got to leave you, but I'm going to come. A little further in the conversation, chapter 14, verse 3, we see Jesus say this. If I go and prepare a place for you, 
I will come again, receive you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Jesus was telling them of the marriage plan. Everything in Revelation that John, the revelation that John had, fulfills what Jesus said and what the major and minor prophets said. Brings it to a wrapped up, neat conclusion. Now, I want you to watch this. Because once the price is accepted, and the bride accepts, once you accept salvation, and the bride accepts, listen, oh, two wonderful things happen. When the bride accepts, follow this now, uh, the, the, the bridegroom pours two glasses of wine, and you drink together and celebrate your marriage. You're married then. But your marriage isn't consummated until the home's prepared and he returns to get you. So you belong to no other. You're not with your bridegroom yet. But you belong to him. And your identity begins changing. You know why? Because the dowry that he paid, he leaves. And now you don't work anymore. If you were working a job, now you don't work anymore. You get to rest. But that's not all. You get to, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. You get to enjoy the gifts that he left. And we know the gifts Jesus left. Amen. But that's not all. Your identity changes. Now you have maid servants. You have people to serve you. That's what the Holy Spirit, the angels of God do. The angels of God are the ministering spirits to his bride. And you're supposed to be resting in the new covenant. You don't work. You're in the grace of God and you rest. And it goes further. Watch this. The only thing that changed up to this point. Other than you see the contract hanging up in your house every day. Is these gifts are left there. But you haven't started using them all yet. But that's not all that changes. Slowly but surely. As you're getting prepared. Because you don't know when he's going to come. You know he's going to come at midnight. But you don't know when he's going to come. So you're getting prepared every day. You have white garments that are laid out. But they're not on yet. They're just laid out. Because you're in the world. But not of it. See, you're, you're the righteousness of Christ. But you're in the world. You're going to look just like the world. But you're not of it. Because now your identity begins to change. Did you know this? That because you're this bride, you're now decorated as a married woman. Oh, yeah. Your hairstyle changes. Your clothing changes. Your jewelry changes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're given rings to show you belong to another. But here's the craziest part. You ready for this? In a traditional Jewish family, in the era, in the era we're talking about, the bride-to-be was given henna tattoos. And those tattoos were markings of the journey that she had to her beloved. A tattoo that was not permanent. A tattoo that was given so that when an outsider looked, because she was now a covered woman, she was no longer left open advertising. She was covered because she belonged to another. But in her privacy, when she looked in the mirror, there were markings on her body reminding her, price paid, who she belonged to, how much he loved her. In fact, let me, let me show you what it looked like. Don't take my word for it. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 6, um, verses 6 through 14. Ezekiel 6. No, I'm sorry. Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel 16, I'm sorry. And we're going to start at verse 6 and read through verse 14. Okay? Ezekiel 16, 6 through 14. And this is the prophet speaking of the wedding. You ready? And when I passed by you, I saw you polluted in your own blood. You were lost. You didn't know him. And I said to you when you were in your blood, live. I said to you when you were in your blood, live. What did he say to you when you accepted him? Live, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Verse 7, I've caused you to multiply as the bud of the field. And you've increased and waxed and great. And you are come to excellent ornaments. 
Your breasts are fashioned. Your hair is grown where before you were naked and bare. Other words, with Christ in your life, you are now fruitful. Now that you belong to Him, He has granted you gifts and you are fruitful. And He's pouring His love out on His betrothed, the church, the body of Christ, the believer. Verse 8, Now when I passed by you and looked at you, Behold, your time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over you and I covered your nakedness. And I swore to you and entered into a covenant with you. This is the marriage covenant. Okay? Thus saith the Lord God, and you became mine. And then... Oh, here's what happens in the life of a believer. I'm telling you, this is written in the Old Covenant, prophesied what Christ was going to do in the New. This is great stuff. Look at verse 9. I washed you with water. Baptism. Baptism of the Holy Ghost. I washed, yes, I thoroughly washed away all your blood from you, and I anointed you with oil. There's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I clothed you with broidered work. I covered you in badger skins. These are the very things that were in the temple. What is he saying? Your body has become the temple, the habitation of the Holy Spirit. That's wild, isn't it? Look. And I girded you about with fine linen and covered you with silk. There's your value. Your value. He's adorned you and covered you with his value. I decked you also with ornaments. Boy, the church I came from, they couldn't have read this because they didn't believe in jewelry and all this fixing up of the hair. But I want you to know God decks His bride out. The reason women like to wear jewelry now and makeup, believe it or not, it's it's a spiritual thing. It's a thing that, that, you know what, this is how I was born natural, but this is how I see myself. And Is that... Identity change. You want to see a woman's identity change? Catch her at home early in the morning, no makeup, knock on the door. She comes to the door and, oh my God, she's backing up, covering up, trying. But give her time to go get fixed up. And she'll come out to the door, oh baby, what you talking about? Just full of herself and got it going on. She'll be confident. Her whole identity changes. That is all based in what is happening. Now that Christ lives in you, where's your confidence? Your beauty comes from the inside out. But the symbol was the outside adorning. Watch. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. I covered you with ornaments. I put bracelets on your hand, a chain on your neck, a jewel on your forehead. And I flipped out when my daughter wanted her ears pierced. When she wanted a little stud in her nose and wanted more in her ears. And I'm going, oh God, slow down. God decorated a whole lot more than that. Put a stone in the forehead. Look. And a beautiful crown upon your head. Girls, how would you like to walk around with a crown on every day, all day? Would that just not be the bomb? Everybody know you were the princess then, huh? Yeah. There you go. I put a crown, um, earrings on your ears, a crown on your head. And thus you were decked out with gold and silver. Your raiment was of fine linen and silk embroidered work. You did eat fine flour, honey, and oil. You were exceeding beautiful. And you did prosper into a kingdom. And you, your renown went forth among the heathen for your beauty. And it was, for it was perfect through my comeliness. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm plain, but I made you beautiful. This I put upon you, said the Lord God. There's the perfect picture of of the bride throughout this process of, of, of waiting, of waiting for the return of her bride. The bridegroom is just the, the bride, waiting for the bridegroom. The bride is just adorning herself in the gifts of the Spirit and in the operations of the Spirit. And she's reaching others, she's multiplying, she's producing for her bride when he comes back. Now, Now watch this. She's urged. She's urged to make ready every day of her life. One of the reasons why you're taught as a young Christian is to pray every night before you go to bed. The the Old Testament symbolism for that is to make sure you're ready in case he comes at midnight. Now we know he's coming as a thief in the night. You see, when the father then tells the groom... Go get your bride. An amazing thing happens. He waits till the appointed time, midnight. Because the tradition is, he comes as a thief. Why? Because she's supposed to be swept off of her feet 
and carried away. There's the rapture. She doesn't, she doesn't walk. She doesn't work to get to him. He comes to her as a thief. Sweeps her up. Steals her away. You with me? But before he does that, watch what happens. You ready for this? Before he does that, he sends out two groups of people. First, he sends out proclaimers. And these proclaimers are carrying an oil-filled lamp. And they begin running through the streets of her hometown, shouting, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And right on their heels are the second group blowing trumpets because they're going to wake up the whole village. They're going to wake up the whole village. See, we're told the believers only are that village. That the believers are going to hear. Right? That the believers are going to be ready. Fits right into the Jewish wedding. Those invited to the wedding are the only ones that hear. Not those that aren't. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you're going to be transformed from this body to a heavenly body. Leaving no trace except for the clothes and the memory of where you used to be. Remember, I tied in how that fits in with blue, this blue beam technology. And how they're going to cover that up where the world won't know. Even the very elect would be deceived if they could. That's how slick Satan's working this out. Because if the world woke up and saw all the believers gone, they'd know something. Some back, some, somebody who went to church and never gave their life to Christ would, would begin to shout out. But the Bible says, so how's the devil got to do it? He's got, when the rapture takes place, he's got to have such a scheme laid out. Nobody has a clue it was Jesus that came and did it. He's got to have a scheme laid out. And don't you dare fret, he's got one. He's dumb, but he's not stupid. He's a planner. He said, 7,000 years to work this out. And he's working it out. Watch. What happens then? <clears throat> What's the next part of this wedding? The, the nation. Once they're called up, they gather together under the ketuba. Okay? <clears throat> With the ketuba, under the chupa. And this, we just saw that. The bowing of. The four pillars of the chupa. And they, they come together. It was in 19 and verse 2. The, the, the chupa is open. The witnesses have to be there for the wedding. The witnesses are gathered. There's the 20 and 4 elders. And the 4 kings of the 4 kingdoms of the earth. They're there. The witnesses have assembled. The wedding is then sealed by the presence of the Father. The bride is then covered with a veil. A bedeacon. She's covered. This covering shows her purity. This covering means you did it, you're there. The, we just read that, that she was ready. She would put on her garments. What were those garments that she put on? When she left that one body, she put on that glorified body. Those are the robes of righteousness that she's put on. She's standing there in heaven now. And to see, watch this, to seal the deal, here's where the hallelujahs come in. The ketuba is red as the wedding ceremony. It's not do you take her to be your and will you and will you don't. All that was determined 2,000 years ago at Calvary. So the four hallelujahs are the witnesses singing the marriage contract. They're singing the ketuba. The part of the Jewish wedding under the chupa where the marriage of the two is sealed and become one. Then the ring in the Jewish ceremony is given. And the ring in the Jewish ceremony is symbolic of a crown. The, ring, the wedding ring is a symbol of a crown. The crown is placed on her head. And you know there are seven crowns. We discussed those earlier in the book of Revelation. And then... Seven blessings are spoken. Seven blessings. Read the blessings laid out in the Alleluias. The seven blessings are spoken in place of the seven bowls. 
the seven vials, the seven trumpets, the seven curses, the seven years of tribulation. Where the world experiences seven bad, the believer, the bride, now gets seven good. Because God is good. Amen. Then, then what happens? At the end of every Jewish wedding, they drink a glass of wine. What are we told is going to be served at the wedding feast? Wine. Jesus said, I won't drink wine again until we're together in heaven. That wine is enjoyed again. The fruit of the labor of the great vineyard master, Jesus Christ. The one whose life was crushed and poured out for you. Then what happens after the wine? Everybody been to a Jewish wedding or watch one on TV knows this. They throw that glass down and they holler, Mazel tov! They throw it down. In other words, they're saying, Let's celebrate. Let's go home. But watch. <clears throat> because this is a part of the Jewish traditional wedding that's been lost. When that is done, when the mazel tov is sounded, the breaking of glass. Remember, all throughout prophecy, all the peoples of the world are referred to as sea of glass. Glass. Broken. You see, there are enemies of the bride still on earth. And this is what we've forgotten in the Jewish ceremony. And you've got to go way back and dig to pull this up. That the bridegroom had to announce at the wedding that he had vanquished all the enemies of the bride. That her home would be a safe place. That all of her past was past. It was forgotten. There'd be no remembrance. There'd be no more tears. There'd be no more worry. So what has Jesus got to go do? He's got to gather up the bridal party. And they're all going to get on white horses. And he's going to return and vanquish the enemies of his bride. You see, that's the next part. Then comes the celebration. And the celebration's we get to chapter 21 at that point. You see, the wedding's been consummated. And the new life and the new home begins. And when we get to that part of how beautiful heaven is, it's going to blow your mind. What your new home is going to look like is going to blow your mind. And next week, I'm going to introduce you to a book that I read some, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. Where a woman wrote about her encounter in heaven. And she did this not for money. She was a botanist. And a writer. And she died for five minutes during the Black Plague in England. And it was five years in heaven. And her descriptions of the different jobs and the different teaching. And the river of life. And how every time you go down you come up younger. And the food and, and how your mansion is built and who built it. And people that come and, and get you to welcome you home. So that you're not afraid. And all the things that happen if you die before the rapture. And the description of heaven is mind-blowing, scriptural too, just not what we've been taught. Because most of us have been taught that going to heaven is like a 24-hour a day for every eternity church service. And honestly, some of our church services, you don't want to be in for 45 minutes, much less eternity. So heaven looks a lot different. It's a lot different. We're going to talk about that some next week. In the meantime, in the meantime, keep an eye on the news. Follow the European stuff. Get excited. Second thing, listen to me well. Your neighbors need hope. They need love. And God put you there to do what? Hide or to share the love of Christ? Go share. Start in your own home with your own family. Make things right. Repair bridges, mend things. Then step out in your neighborhood. Begin loving on your neighbors. Be a servant to them. Be the ox, not the lion. Be the servant to them. Days of the lion are coming. Right now we're in the days of the oxen. We're the servants. Go be a servant to somebody. Don't forget this upcoming Sunday is our big reveal about what God's plans are and what we're going to be doing at Journey Church. And lastly, if you are enjoying this Wine Press Bible study, could I possibly talk you into going to our website or writing me a card, write me an email. And if possible, could you send some financial support and help us build a home 
where we can resource more believers and send them out. God's blessed us right now. We're, we're resourcing pastors, not just for teaching. We are financially blessing pastors and, and other churches, helping them through their struggle. Journey Church isn't a pond. We're a fountain. What comes in goes out. And we'd love for you to be a blessing and a part of that. Heavenly Father, bless those that have watched today. Strengthen and encourage them and challenge them, Lord, to realize they are the bride. And you love the bride, Lord. <laughs> and you bless us when we bless the bride. With tithe, offering, with service, with love, with sharing the love of our bridegroom. And how he wants everybody to be part of that bridal party. Help us, Lord, be a reflection of you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you. Love you.